Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. You can support this podcast on patreon.com slash teamaneke. Radio Free Palmer 89.5 KVRF presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. I'm Alex Stein, and this is Iditarod Through the Decades from Mushing Radio. Today, Episode 4, the 1990s. The 1990s began for Iditarod in the same way the 1980s ended, with Susan Butcher and Rick Swenson battling for the championship. Butcher would capture her fourth win in 1990, and Swenson would come back in 1991 to win his record fifth championship, a feat that has not been equaled to this day nearly 30 years later. Many thought Butcher would be the one to notch a fifth win in 1991. She was in the lead coming out of White Mountain, but was forced by a storm to turn back. Swenson went out in the storm and was able to power through and claim his fifth victory. But change was in the air. During the 1991 race, the American Humane Society sent an observer to look at the Iditarod, and they issued a 10-page report after the race. The Humane Society recommended a series of rule changes, some of which the Iditarod Trail Committee said were already in the works. Iditarod had become a big business, attracting more and more volunteers from all over the world, and there was some concern that a boycott by animal rights groups would harm the race. The group Mush with Pride, which stands for Providing Responsible Information on a Dog's Environment, was founded in 1991 to provide standards for best practices in dog care. Iditarod mushers were required to join Mush with Pride, which spelled out sled dog care and racing equipment guidelines, as well as setting up a kennel inspection program. This was not enough to satisfy many animal rights activists, who to this day want to do away with all mushing and insist that the act of putting dogs in harness and having them pull sleds or having them be tethered to kennels is inherently harmful to the dogs. The Humane Society's report stated that it regards dogs as pets and not as working animals and referred to the practice of raising animals on large dog lots as repugnant. Most people who have been around large dog lots or have witnessed the care that mushers put into their dogs would disagree. Other rule changes after the 1991 race brought the Iditarod closer to the race fans would recognize today. Following that 1991 race, straw bedding would be provided for dogs at checkpoints. The length of the mandatory rest in White Mountain was increased from six hours to eight to ensure that dogs and mushers would be able to think clearly and make good decisions during that last dash to Nome. Another rule change mandated that dogs running in Iditarod be northern breeds. This change was partially in response to Iditarod runs by John Souter, who ran a team primarily made up of standard poodles. Souter had noted that standard poodles were powerful work dogs, and he had trained several as sled dogs and was impressed with their speed and dedication. Although Souter's teams never seriously challenged the top Iditarod teams, he managed to get a lot of attention. Souter, who proudly embraced the label the Poodle Man, was a press favorite, especially for press outside of Alaska, and he appeared on The Tonight Show with several of his dogs. Many mushers worried that the Poodle's lack of warm winter fur makes them unsuitable for parts of the Iditarod Trail, where it can be extremely cold and windy. Others felt that the press attention should have gone to the winners of the race and the serious contenders, and not to someone who was running an off-breed of dogs. Another rule change prohibited mushers from accepting help at checkpoints. In the past, 
many of the more popular or successful mushers were given preferential treatment at some villages, which could give them a huge advantage. Prior to this rule taking effect, some top mushers would be whisked off to sleep in a bed at certain checkpoints, while other mushers were forced to sleep on the floor of village schools or community buildings. During the late 1980s and early 1990s, many recreational mushers began dreaming of running the Iditarod themselves. Several veteran mushers began leasing dog teams to these wannabe Iditarod competitors. This provided people with the opportunity to work with well-trained dogs, many of whom had run previous Iditarods and other medium and long distance races, as well as giving people access to all of the necessary equipment and infrastructure required to run Iditarod. It also was a way that people with a lot of money could cross an item off of their bucket lists. Although many people think that Iditarod mushers raise each and every one of their dogs from birth, this is often not the case. Even back in the earliest Iditarods, it was common for mushers to buy or borrow dogs from other kennels to round out their Iditarod teams. Partially as a result of the growth of so-called leased teams, the ITC started making changes to determine what mushers would need to do to qualify to run Iditarod. In early years, it was enough for a would-be Iditarod musher to get a recommendation from a musher known to members of the ITC. The 1990s was a decade of firsts for Iditarod. Martin Boozer's win in 1991 was the first time a non-American had won. 1995's win for Doug Swingley was the first win for someone based outside of Alaska. Speeds increased and race records were shattered. 1992 was the first race won in under 11 days, and 1996 was the first race won in under 10 days. The race attracted and then lost several big-name sponsors, and in 1991, for the first time, the winner received not only a cash prize, but also a brand new truck, a prize that continues to this day to be awarded. Partially in reaction to objections from animal rights groups, the Iditarod enacted the expired dog rule in 1996. Under this rule, any team that had a dog die on the trail would be disqualified unless, quote, the cause of death is an external force beyond the mutcher's control, such as a moose or a snow machine, unquote. But in 1996, Rick Swenson had a dog die near Squetna, just 149 miles into the race. There was no clear cause of death and Swenson was furious about his disqualification, telling the press, there are a lot of people who don't understand dog mushing who are running this dog race. Swenson later threatened to sue the ITC, and the rule was quickly eliminated. But more than anything, I did a ride in the 1990s was the story of the domination of three legendary mushers, Martin Boozer, Jeff King, and Doug Swingley. Martin Boozer grew up in Switzerland and came to Alaska in 1979 after serving his compulsory military service. Boozer's family always had a lot of animals when he was growing up, and it seemed natural that he found himself working with Earl and Natalie Norris when he came to Alaska. The Norrises were among the most respected breeders of Siberian Huskies, and many of their dogs were sold to Europeans who used them for dog races in Europe. Boozer worked 12 hours a day in their dog lot, caring for up to 250 dogs in exchange for room and board. Norris dogs had competed in many sprint races, but they were curious about how their dogs would do in long distance races. Boozer started extra training with the dogs so that he could see how the Siberians would do running Iditarod. Martin Boozer ran his rookie race in 1980, the first year after the fire on the farewell burn, and was so relieved to be out of that area and into the checkpoint of Nikolai that he named his first son after that checkpoint. His other son, by the way, is named Roan, after another Iditarod checkpoint. After solid finishes in the late 1980s, the turning point for Martin Boozer came in the 1991 race. When Susan Butcher returned to White Mountain, Boozer headed out chasing after Rick Swenson. Boozer would finish second in that race, coming under the world arch two hours after Swenson, and more than three hours ahead of Butcher, who finished in third. The confidence that Martin Boozer and his dogs gathered in the 1991 race paid off the next year 
when Boozer won in record time, becoming the first person ever to finish Iditarod in under 11 days. He would finish in the top 10 every year of the 1990s, winning the race three times and coming in second three other times. Jeff King was born in California and made his way up to Alaska in 1975 in search of adventure. He started a construction business and soon fell in love with mushing and started acquiring dogs. He began racing in 1980 and entered his first Iditarod in 1981. King ran into Joe Reddington as he was filling out his paperwork and later admitted that he didn't recognize the father of the Iditarod. King was obsessed with preparations and making sure that every detail was right for his rookie run. But once he got out on the trail, Jeff King found himself faced with many obstacles he hadn't foreseen and soon found himself exhausted and falling behind. He was shocked when he heard Joe Reddington say he'd only trained with his dogs for about 300 miles before entering the 1981 race. At the time, training several hundred miles a week was considered necessary for someone to even finish a race like Iditarod. Jeff King got to McGrath a full 24 hours ahead of Joe Reddington and wondered how Reddington would even make it to Nome. King was struggling when he was outside of Ofer, and he saw a headlamp coming up behind him and soon heard a voice calling out, On by. King pulled his team off the trail and was surprised when Joe Reddington himself passed him. Reddington asked who it was on the side of the trail, and Jeff King said his name, and Reddington said, Jeff King, you're doing great. Keep going. That praise would stick with King for years, especially because he felt at that moment like he was doing anything but great. Reddington's dogs, on the other hand, looked fantastic and kept getting better and better as he continued towards Nome. King struggled to finish as a rookie, coming in 28th, while Reddington finished 14th. It would be another 10 years before Jeff King would run Iditarod again. After finishing 12th in 1991, King gave up his construction business, devoting himself full-time to dogs and racing. That decision paid off in a big way. King was a dominant force for the next 17 years, racking up four wins and 16 top 10 finishes. He's lived for decades just outside Denali National Park, and it was there that he met his future wife and the mother of his three daughters. Donna Gates, an award-winning artist, was working at the time as a park ranger and was out running a small dog team. Jeff King's dogs and hers got tangled, and as they untangled the dogs, they started talking, and before long, they were married. All King's children have run the junior Iditarod, and one ran Iditarod with a second training to run the race soon. Jeff King is also well known in the Iditarod community for his innovations in equipment design. After falling asleep on the runners and falling off his sled, he developed a sit-down sled that would help him get some rest while on the trail. Today, nearly every team that runs long-distance races uses a sled that enables mushers to sit. King's Husky Homestead Kennels gives tourists a chance to watch his sled dogs in action, as well as hear stories from King's own race career and from the proud history of mushing in Alaska. In his first victory in 1993, King would manage to stay ahead of several large storms and many strong competitors, including second place finisher Didi Genro, as well as champions Rick Mackey, Susan Butcher, Martin Boozer, and Rick Swenson. King would win twice more in the 1990s and finish twice in third place, always challenging Boozer and Swingley and always fielding a team that had a good shot at winning. Doug Swingley grew up in Montana and didn't start mushing until 1989. Swingley was the first musher from the lower 48 to win Iditarod. Swingley finished ninth in his rookie year in 1992 after winning the Dorothy G. Page Halfway Award and finished in the top 10 10 years in a row, winning the race four times. In an article in the Anchorage Daily News, Following the death of Dick Wilmarth, who won the first Iditarod in 1973 and then never entered the race again, race marshal Mark Nordman talked about how Wilmarth was in the ghost town of Iditarod during the 1995 race when Nordman was serving as a race judge. Wilmarth asked if anyone wanted to go up in his plane to look for approaching dog teams, 
and Nordman took off with him. The two men found the leading team and landed by the side of the trail to learn that the leader was none other than Doug Swingley. Wilmarth offered to trade his airplane for Swingley's dog team. Swingley replied, not a chance, and continued down the trail with his fast dog team on his way to his first win. Swingley's win shattered the previous Iditarod record by more than a day, and he became the first musher to finish the race in under 10 days. Swingley would break his own record five years later, finishing in just under nine days and one hour. He would also match Susan Butcher's three-peat, winning the race in 1999, 2000, and 2001. Joe Reddington Sr. competed in Iditarod periodically, including every year from 1984 to 1992. His best finish was fifth place in 1988 at age 71. But the father of the Iditarod could not resist competing in the 25th running of the race in 1997, even though he was 80 years old. Reddington said that he didn't feel 80, but reporters following him through the race reported that he frequently looked exhausted. Reddington soon found himself towards the back of the pack, but that gave him more time to visit with old friends in the villages along the trail and regale everyone he saw with stories of Iditarod and his life working with dogs. Everywhere Joe Reddington went, people were eager to shake his hand and take photos with him. If it seemed a little like a rock band on a farewell tour, it was a rock band on a triumphant farewell tour. Reddington was treated like a conquering hero at every stop along the way. Unfortunately, a dog of his named Nip died on the way into McGrath. A necropsy was inconclusive, and it put a damper on Reddington's race for quite a while. Reddington got a hero's welcome at Unalakleet, which cheered him up considerably and bolstered his mood as he made his way up the coast into Nome. He finished a respectable 36th out of 44 finishers, just behind Dan Seavey, himself a veteran of the first race in 1973, who was running Iditarod again for the first time in 23 years. When Reddington crossed under the Burled Arch in Nome, he got a reception larger than the one that greeted winner Martin Boozer. Boozer himself came out to congratulate Reddington, and former Alaska Governor Wally Hickel was there as well. At the awards banquet, Reddington was given the award for Most Inspirational Musher. Eight months later, Joe Reddington Sr. was diagnosed with cancer of the esophagus. He underwent chemo and had an operation which wiped out the cancer, but also made him lose 20 pounds and his hair. It took many months for Reddington to get his strength back, but by the summer of 1998, he was manning the Iditarod booth at the Alaska State Fair, where he was routinely mobbed by fans. And he was talking about running the Iditarod again in the year 2000. Sadly, that didn't happen. The cancer returned in 1999, and Joe Reddington Sr., the well-known and well-loved father of the Iditarod, died on June 24, 1999, surrounded by his family. Two days later, Reddington was buried in a dog sled, as was his wish. Later, 700 people gathered at the Iditarod headquarters in Kinnick for a memorial service. Friends and family members told stories about Reddington for hours. Flags around the state flew at half-mast. A few years later, on February 1st, 2003, a life-size bronze statue of Reddington was unveiled outside Iditarod headquarters. On by. Here are the Iditarod champions for the 1990s. 1990, Susan Butcher with lead dog Sluggo and Lightning in 11 days, 1 hour, 53 minutes, and 23 seconds. 1991, Rick Swenson with lead dog Goose in 12 days, 16 hours, 34 minutes, and 39 seconds. 1992, Martin Boozer with lead dogs Tyrone and D2 in 10 days, 19 hours, 17 minutes, and 15 seconds. 1993, Jeff King with lead dogs Herbie and Kitty in 10 days, 15 hours, 38 minutes, and 15 seconds. 1994, 
Martin Boozer with Lead Dogs D2 and Dave in 10 days, 13 hours, 5 minutes, and 39 seconds. 1995, Doug Swingley with Lead Dogs Vic and Elmer in 10 days, 13 hours, 2 minutes, and 39 seconds. 1996, Jeff King with Lead Dogs Jake and Booster in 9 days, 5 hours, 43 minutes, and 13 seconds. 1997, Martin Boozer with Lead Dogs Blondie and Fearless in 9 days, 8 hours, 30 minutes, and 45 seconds. 1998, Jeff King with Lead Dogs Red and Jenna in 9 days, 5 hours, 52 minutes, and 26 seconds. 1999, Doug Swingley with Lead Dogs Stormy, Cola, and Elmer in 9 days, 14 hours, 31 minutes, and 7 seconds. Next week, the early 2000s, the race goes global as Team Norway storms into Alaska. For Iditarod Through the Decades, I'm Alex Stein. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forda and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com. If you like our podcast, there are a few things you can do. You can take a couple of minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also check out all of our DogWorks Radio sponsors and promotions in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go over to Facebook, like our Facebook page, and one last thing, please tell all of your friends by spreading the word about DogWorks Radio. Thank you so much for listening to us. We really appreciate you. DogWorks Radio is produced by Robert Forto. Logo art by Angry Squirrel Studios. DogWorks Radio is produced in conjunction with KVRF 89.7 in Palmer, Alaska. For dog training advice, you can contact Alaska DogWorks at 907 841 1686 or visit their website at alaskadogworks.com. If you have a show idea or would like to be a guest, please contact us by sending an email to live at dogworksradio.com. <laughs>